Juist in deze onzekere tijden is het belangrijk om elkaar te blijven ontmoeten, te informeren en te inspireren over hoe we het morgen slimmer en beter kunnen doen. Welkom bij de livecast van Pakhuis de Zwijger. On uh, behalf of uh, Pakhuis de Zwijger and uh, RLS, uh, Pan Decolonial Network in Amsterdam, I would like to welcome our guests and the online viewers to the Indigenous Liberation Series. The series itself is organized in relation to the 12th of October, the day that Columbus arrived in Abia Yala. Indigenous peoples started using the term Abia Yala at the end of the 1970s to refer to the American continent. Renaming the continent was basically a first step toward epistemic decolonization. My name is Antoine Deul, and I will be your moderator tonight. In my life, I am tracing my ancestral footprints in search of inspiration and guidance to decolonize futures. And that has led me to co-founding the Nature's Narrative uh, platform and the Black Renaissance Collectives here in the Netherlands. Tonight, we kick off with the program Decolonizing 1492. The 12th of, of, the 12th of October 1492 marks the beginning of not only genocide against indigenous peoples, but also relates to the beginning of chattel slavery and exploitation of Mother Earth. Our conversation with our guests will have two parts. Part one, what did 1492 mean for the world historically? and present day impacts. And part two, reparations and decolonization, how to move towards a just and decolonial future. So we're all set and we have some drinks, we have some mezcal to get us through the evening. <laughs> um, before introducing our guests, I would like to welcome Chao Tuleo also known as Celine Kuhn. She is co-founder of uh, Arales. And um, Chao Tuleo, on a more uh, personal note, could you share what the 12th of October 1492 means to you as a Mapuche? Thank you so much for having me. It's a nice question. And I think I would like to start with a quote. Um, uh, a quote uh, is done by a Chilean newspaper back in the days. And I think it's good for us to understand how we Mapuche were seen in the media back in the days. So let me get this quote. Um, the Indian is absolutely incapable of being civilized. His intelligence has remained at the level of beast of prey never once experienced moral emotion. How shall man safely approach these wild beasts? How does the peaceful and industrious population enter the forest where ferocity and barbarism find shelter? An association of barbarians, as barbarous as the Pampas or Mapuche Indians, is nothing more than a horde of beasts which urgently begs to be enslaved or destroyed in the interest of humanity and the greater good of civilization. So this is how we were seen in the media. So um, 1492 is to me the start of death. It's like a reflection of the dark side of humans. Uh, when you think about the atrocities, the massacres, the genocide, the rapes, um, it's all led by uh, evil, murderous colonists. So millions of like indigenous brothers and sisters have died, and even now, today, millions are still like in a struggle. So this is like a nice picture, a nice image. That I mean, at the end of the day, it's still the same enemy. It still is there. Mm -hmm. So I really like this image. Uh, so thank you, Max, for having this. Um, I want to talk more about the personal, like personal, from a personal note. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a saying, a Mapuche saying, and um, it's also about us being resilient. Um, when you 
when there's a storm, for example, and you hear the thunder, bam, 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 then you know that our ancestors are still involved in a battle, but it's up in the sky. So the ancestors aren't done protecting us from above. So I really like that. Mm. And I really like this mm. also us being resilient. Mm. Um, but tonight, of course, the, we will be sharing a lot of like perspectives. But from my side, um, I think that the stolen children, the stolen indigenous children mm. is very like in relation to 1492, because um, it's the start to me to civilize or attempts to civilize or to assimilate indigenous children mm -hmm. by taking away from them, from, from their communities. Yeah. Uh, children were stolen in Canada, in Australia yeah. or in Chile, like me. And sent to the, to the boarding schools. To huh? the boarding yeah. schools, yeah. Uh, international adoption, like mm -hmm. just be removed. Because when you remove the next generation, mm -hmm. the culture eventually dies. Yeah. So you don't have no culture anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's also a way of diminishing like the indigenous cultures. So when I was, um, I was in, um, in 2004, I was in Chile, I was in Barcelona together with my mother and we were seeing this Col uh, Columbus statue. So nowadays you see a lot of people trying to get rid mm -hmm. of the statues, mm -hmm. you know, in the streets. Yeah. But me and my mother, we were just standing there. We were silent and we were thinking about, you know, what? What if he could listen to us? Why not just interact with Columbus? <laughs> so we were just sitting there and we said, dear Columbus, you think you have broken you, all our communities, but we are still standing here. Mm -hmm. So you didn't break all of us. We, the next generation, are here to stop your celebration, to end this um, Columbus Day, mm -hmm. which is still is celebrating nowadays. It's a day mm -hmm. of joy. So we have this responsibility to stop it and to uh, stop this existence of, um, of him in the streets. So we were just sitting there and we were thinking this could be something because at the end of the day, it's about liberation. It's about how we are liberated from our pain, from our past. And of course, in the future, there will be like new generation of indigenous uh, children. And if we didn't do our homework of liberation, then we have this trauma projected towards the children. Mm -hmm. And this is also like one of the key homework I see for myself to end it and to start healing and to start like listening to, to the elders, how to heal, how to liberate mm -hmm. yourself. Like one of the key questions of my personal life, for sure. Mm -hmm. Whoa, that, that, that's, you know, that, that's beautiful. What a resilience and, and, and what an energy. And I see the ancestors just pouring through your veins. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. They are here. Um, they are here. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And and um, you know, let let me uh, introduce the the rest uh, of our uh, guest speakers. Um, we have three uh, wonderful uh, guest speakers who are amongst others uh, decolonial thinkers, reparation scholars, and environmental philosophers. They will inspire us with different narratives and different ways of knowing and seeing tonight. Here with us in the, study, in, in the studio, we have uh, Carolina Sanchez. She's a philosopher and eco-feminist scholar, affiliated researcher at Icon Utrecht University. Her academic work is dedicated to environmental ethics and a theory of justice for nature. Mm. Her expertise also resides in ecosystems ethics, uh, ancestral knowledges, indigenous sacred places, and its international legality. We also have on uh, online Esther Stanford Cosse. She is a reparations legal expert, interdisciplinary law and history scholar activist, public speaker, author and PhD candidate researcher at un the University of Chichester. Her work builds on the legacy of Pan-African liberation movements. Last but not least, we also have online Rolando Vasquez, 
Associate Professor of Sociology at the University College Roosevelt and Director of both the Decolonial Summer School and the Going Local Mexico for Intercultural Encounters with Students and Local Communities. His expertise lies in decolonial, decolonial thought and critique on modernity. Let's start off with, with you, uh, Rolando. Could you take us back to the 12th of October, 1492, through your decolonial lens and elaborate what the arrival of Columbus meant for Abiy Ayala and the rest of the world, and in a sense, to the whole of humanity and the state of emergency the world is in today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, in this important day, or the commemoration of this important day. Uh, well, 1492 is an important marker for us, for, <clears throat> for the world. It is a moment of the birth of Western civilization. And uh, if you think about it, before 1492, there was no world center in Europe. There was no Western civilization as such. We were living in a multipolar world. Before 1492, there were no indigenous in the world. Nobody was called indigenous in the way it was used after 1492. Uh, there were no black people because the racialization of the other that comes through enslavement can also be originated in that moment of the Western conquest of Abiyayala. And there was no Europe. So the very idea of Europe as the center of the world and as being in the now of history is only possible through 1492. So it is a massive event in world history that uh, that also unleash a massive genocide. Uh, it, um, it killed the majority of the population of the Americas, and to such an extent that, um, that the geologists today can see in the ice caps uh, the marker of the loss of human population. Uh, it is also the moment of the establishment of an ecocide, the destruction of the rainforest, and the introduction of a of a relation to nature as a thing, as an object of production. So I would I would say that a very particular place where we can think how 1492 inaugurates a a different world order is the plantation. In the plantation, we see this radical combination of genocide with ecocide. It is the system for the extraction of life, the extraction of human life through slavery and the extraction of the life of Earth through the monocultures that were implemented in the plantation economy. And it is today uh, still the big danger that we are all facing, this systematic extraction of life that is based on the destruction of the world of others and on the killing of the earth. So for us, the decolonial perspective is a perspective that strives for global justice, to undo, undo the colonial difference, and that calls for the task of healing, healing the colonial wound and moving towards a pluriversal world order. Undo this world order that is inaugurated in 1492. Okay, thank you, uh, Rolando. Could you um, talk a little bit uh, about the pluriversal world order that you just mentioned? So what, what, what do you mean uh, by that? Well, uh, the, the Western project of civilization implied the imposition of a single world, of a single narrative, 
a narrative that was dominated by the West. And the pluriversal is following the Zapatista wisdom, is a world where many worlds can fit and where there is no possibility of a world uh, eliminating other worlds. So that is a major principle of the pluriversal, the idea that we can live together in difference, with difference, that we can celebrate plurality, that we are actually impoverished as human beings when we live in a monocultural order. Mm -hmm. So the pluriversal is a way out of this monoculture that is geared as indigenous philosophers have taught us, that is geared towards the extraction of life. Mm. So in the face of the project of death, as the Zapatistas will also say, and the National Indigenous Congress in Mexico, uh, we are engaged in a politics of life that implies pluriversality, it implies a respect of the life of others, of the cultures of others, but also of the life of the non-humans, mm -hmm. of the life of Earth, of Earth beings, mm -hmm. and the life of the ancestral. Mm -hmm. That is something that the West will dismiss in its, in its intoxication for the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and we'll, we'll come uh, uh, back to that later, be, because I think that um, before 1492, uh, we were already living in, in such a world, uh, mm, mm, I guess. Mm. Um, okay, let, let me go to um, Carolina. Yeah. Uh, welcome uh, in the studio. Um, what also happened, um, if, if you mark 1492 uh, in history as, as a very uh, important time, um, we can also see a change emerging in the relationship with nature where humans are being separated from nature and nature is turned into a commodity to, to be exploited. And uh, it, it's not seen anymore as a community that humanity uh, uh, belongs to. Could you elaborate how 1492 marks a change in the relationship with nature by colonialism and capitalism and what the impact has been on Mother Earth and the ways of knowing of indigenous cultures? I was thinking about that question um, for more than two weeks, I think, since Max <laughs> okay. sent me all this. And by the way, many yeah. thanks for inviting yeah. me to this no, uh, yes. gathering today. I'm honored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, I was thinking the best way to answer you this, and probably it's not going to be over, but I think that we can think about first, about think about first about the 1492 in terms of um a process that has not ended yet is a process that it is not complete. Mm -hmm. It is usually mentioned in its history books, in the history books of the school, that is a process of the past. And I do have a different opinion about that. I don't think it's a process of the past. I think that 1492 is very much present in the world that we are living mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's one point. A second element to understand the way that um, this, um, this date changed our relation to nature huh? is to look at the work of indigenous feminists. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the things I know about this I have learned with indigenous feminists mm -hmm, who do not call themselves eco-feminists. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, they, there's something, um, diff something strange for that. They do understand the meaning of that, but they are not called themselves ecofeminists or something like that. I say at, at most, they use this um, feminist um, label uh, to, to talk about their rights. But um, for instance, um, scholars like Aura Cumes, uh, Maya Quiche of, um, in Guatemala, and Silvia Gusakanki uh, had been warning about the um, emphasis in, the, in putting the 1492 as something from the past, because for them, uh, um, for them, this 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 um, date uh, started before 1492 colonialism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't mm -hmm. start on 40, uh, with the arrivals of the co of the Spaniards in no. Avia Ayala. Mm -hmm. uh, 1492 for Silvia Kusakanki and uh, Aura Cumes started 
uh, much before in Europe and um, especially with the witch hunting oh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. of women no. yeah. uh, uh, in uh, mm-hmm. from the 11th until um, 18th century in Europe with mm-hmm. laws mm-hmm. that were made to to actually to burn women that mm-hmm. were considered as witches, and that will have um, a very um, deep impact. Uh, in the way of the um, the colonizers thought about mm-hmm. uh, about this new continent that they will meet, but and this um, uh, uh, yeah this inf- um, indigenous feminists uh, still uh, um, call this together with Silvia Federici they call this the yeah. female genocides. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. The female genocides went in the mind of the colonizers in 1492. They were already incorporated in their mm-hmm. knowledge systems. That's the explanation that they say, okay, this is the point where nature um, in Abu Ayala was first introduced as something as a commodity, as, a, as a, uh, something to be in the market. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the point with the hunting of, uh, of witches, of the human bodies. Um, and so uh, with that um, came the, um, the genocide of Jewish people, of Muslim peoples, uh, and the epistemicides of indigenous people mm-hmm. in Abu Yajala. Um, and also very important, the, those, uh, those people that went to Abu Yajala in 1492, uh, um, had also this um, line, the divisory line between nature and uh, humans. Mm-hmm. And this divisory line, if you go to important philosophical texts of uh, Christianity and also um, Greek philosophers, you see that, that it already started there. Uh, so they have this division and it also caused the persecution of the people that oppose it uh, and are still opposed to accept that division and still see um, the earth as a community of living people, mm-hmm. living things, living uh, um, creatures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, um, a very good example of this um, uh, you have in Abi Ayala today a uh, big uh, mortality on uh, indigenous women that are environmental defenders. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the witch hunting continues uh, in, in those bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. And then um, Silvia Kusakanki also says that, okay, well, Dick's going to make an analogy of this. And she said, mm-hmm. um, Something very important, that's the third element, um, that uh, these men that went um, to Abi Ayala um, have this conception of women, uh, this um, separation to the divisory line and so. But then they also um, went and crashed with indigenous epistemologies because indigenous epistemologies, if you see the way they represent, represent Earth is always in the company of women, exactly. mm-hmm. yes. in the fertility no. of women. No. So they they made an, um, Silvia Kusakanki and Aura Kumes made a very good analogy uh, about this. They say, okay, well, the witch hunting is it is still here yeah. because we are, they are still attacking that woman represented on Mother Earth. Yeah. Uh, so it's the femicide that, yeah, that is going on. Yes, yeah, we South have America. to dig her, we have to mm-hmm. destroy it, we have to um, create deforestation mm-hmm. to know the secrets of this women, we, uh, woman body mm-hmm. uh, represented on Earth. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the third point. Um, the fourth point I made, I think, is was related to law. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe we can can uh, uh, um, you know elaborate a little bit more on what you were just saying. Mm-hmm. I think it's very interesting because in her book, uh, Caliban and the Witch, uh, Silvia yeah. Federici also talks a lot about uh, this issue, yeah. and she describes how on the, on the back of the breakdown of the 
feudal system in Europe uh, due to the uh, uh, massive uprisings of peasants and artisans mm. uh, uh, in Europe, the patriarchy, colonialism and capitalism and slavery was created as some sort of counter-revolution by the European ruling class yeah. to find new ways to accumulate, the fight yes. and conquer, exploit labor yes. and mm. land. And because of women, you know, they were the healers. They uh, knew a lot about nature, mm -hmm. about herbs. They were the midwives. So to control nature, mm -hmm. you had to destroy uh, 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 to uh, the women. Name, you have uh, to control, you had to control mm, gender, them. Gender, yeah. And very interesting what, what, uh, the, the an an analogy that, that you're making right now with, with mm -hmm. a femicide. So basically 1492 um, was not the beginning, but no. basically it was, let's say, some kind of counter-revolution to kind of take the approach to, let's say, the new world. Uh, 1492 yeah. was not the beginning of colonial uh, capitalist patriarchy. Definitely mm -hmm. not. Yeah. It, it is the, um, the birth of the West, like Rolando says, mm -hmm. but it's not the beginning of um, um, capitalist colonialism uh, embodied in, in patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. So um, that's something that somebody, uh, th I think that we need to be careful when we talk about uh, 1492 in the past and the way that we yeah. can render a favor to the people that still think that this date mm -hmm. uh, is, is a past event because it is not yeah, for example, mm -hmm. we also think about the Incas, for example, they were like the enemies of the Mapuche mm -hmm. communities. And mm -hmm. we said, OK, then the white men came. Uh, we didn't have a word for, for them. So it was, how can we call them? Let's call them Winka. So it's mm -hmm. like a referral <laughs> to Inca, yeah. Winka. But it's so mm -hmm. it's good that you mentioned this, like yeah. um, a lot of indigenous uh, communities, tribes within Abiyala were also having a lot of like conflicts together. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, to, uh, also let me, I, I want to make a, a bridge and, and, and we'll come back to you later. And uh, let, let, let me uh, get uh, Esther uh, Stanford Sosse, oh. and I hope I pronounce your last name mm -hmm. correctly, into the conversation. Um, greetings. Greetings, uh, Esther. Um, with his last uh, uh, breath, George Floyd refueled the Black Lives Matter uprising of people all over the world to stop the ongoing genocide against black and, indi and indigenous peoples. In your work, Esther, you use the concept of mangamizi. Can you explain what that entails and elaborate on the significance of 1492 for the African continent and the African diaspora? Sure. I, I, I guess I will start with um, the, the last part of the question. First of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this very important discussion. Um, uh, so in terms of the impact of 1492 on the African continent and African people, um, it, it wasn't really the beginning of the chattel enslavement of Africans. That actually happened earlier in the early 1400s mm -hmm. and the kind of key date that we recognize in terms of the beginning of what's known uh, as the transatlantic traffic in enslaved Africans. You may hear elsewhere people use the term transatlantic slave trade, but that's not a term that in the movement for African reparations that we use. That, that was 1441. And where I think there are interesting parallels is the way in which indigenous, so-called indigenous people, taking the point about indigeneity being something that was very much fashioned um, post-1492, but first peoples of the earth um, who had been subjected to these papal bulls, uh, key ones in terms of uh, 1452, Dum Diversus, and 1493. For African people, we were also implicated in that those bulls referred to us too, not just so-called indigenous people. And in fact, the uh, justification for the perpetual enslavement of African people was in uh, provided by the papal bull of 1455, okay? Mm. But why 
1492 we recognize as being significant is that although African people were being trafficked um, and there was the beginning of the disruption of our societies, at the same time as 1492 was going on, we also had um, the remnants of African empires. So it's important to juxtapose that situation of African enslavement and degradation and dehumanization from what we were building for ourselves by ourselves. But 1492 becomes important, taking the point about this uh, political formation of this notion of the West and Europe mm. and how, how this uh, despoilation of Abyayala, including uh, genocide of the peoples there, help to solidify and cement the European power base, okay? That's why it's significant, because until they were able to do that in Abyayala, they were not able, they didn't have the, 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 you know, the power geopolitically, militarily, and so forth, resource-wise, to be able to subjugate properly Africa in terms of the colonization of Africa, which was kind of really, um, formalized in, in the 1800s in terms of the carving up of Africa along the lines of Europe. So that's the significance of it. We have this interconnected history as African people and indigenous peoples, yeah. okay? But that shouldn't surprise us because who are the African people? Who are indigenous people? If we recognize that human civilization began in, in an area that we might today call Africa, also noting that there was kind of one whole continent originally, but that kind of place that we call Africa today, that people, the people from that land peopled the planet. So our bloodlines as African people run through all the peoples of the earth. And listening to what has already been said, there's so many similarities amongst different um, African peoples. So the whole concept of the Ma'angamizi, which we kind of uh, refer to as uh, this experience, the legacies of this uh, rupture, this kind of introduction of a death style as opposed to a lifestyle, that term is a key Swahili term that was really popularized by somebody called Professor Malana Karanga who is a African ethicist, okay? And he advocates that we use this term ma'angamizi to speak to an intentional destruction or attempt to destroy a people, yeah. i.e. African people. Mm -hmm. And when he, re he refers in English, he would say the African Holocaust of enslavement. But like the point that has just been made about 1492 not being a historic event, the concept of the Ma'angamizi is a continuum. Mm -hmm. And when he speaks, Karenga speaks about the African Holocaust of enslavement, he's referring to the morally monstrous destruction of African lives, African cultures, and also African human uh, possibilities. And this notion of the Ma'angamizi is something that many of the campaigning formations that I'm part of, such as PARCO, the Pan-African Reparations Coalition in Europe, and the Stop the Ma'angamizi, We Charge Genocide Ecocide campaign, have evolved into describing as the continuum of chattel, colonial, and neo-colonial enslavement. So mm. those are words that we're using in English, and that's obviously part of the legacy, the way in which English was spread around the world. And so it's not easy always to um, translate uh, language terms from other languages into English. But when we talk about uh, this continuum of enslavement, we have to break down what happened in all those phases. So, you know, when people, that's why we don't like hearing the term slave trade, because when people talk about a slave trade, it minimizes the genocide. And that just becomes like people become casualties of, if you like, a deal that went wrong. OK, it doesn't speak to the intentional destruction of a people. But under chattel slavery, we're talking about, obviously, the imposition of these papal balls that we share 
with all Indigenous peoples. Um, the, the, the kind of overthrow of our Indigenous systems of governance and leadership um, the destruction of our civilizations. We're talking about conquest, ungoverned by law or morality. Um, the introduction of forms of uh, Greco-Roman law, which reinforce this notion of kind of perpetual servitude and subjugation. Um, the elimination of languages, of our cultures, mm -hmm. forced ancestral indoctrination into foreign lands, mm. um, demonization of our spiritual systems, yep. you know, yeah. the way in which we related not only to each other, but to our Mother Earth, you know, mm -hmm. that sustains all life. We're talking about enforced labor, the, the largest forced migration of a people in history. And there's so much that happened during the phase of chattel enslavement. Then when we talk about colonialism, you know, we're now seeing the consolidation of that. And I've already mentioned the carving up of Africa, um, the continuation of wars of destabilization. That's when we really begin to see the loss of sovereignty. And sovereignty is, is a term that we often hear Aboriginal people, Indigenous peoples mm -hmm. also use mm -hmm. to describe what they have been dispossessed of. Um, the wholesale theft and privatization of lands and resources, yep. something that was foreign to us. You know, we didn't own the land. We were custodians. We had a relationship to the land. Um, but this notion of private property was, was a huge thing that was about destroying the collectivity and communitarianity of our societies. Um, the kind of denial of treaties, which also happened with many indigenous peoples, um, the imposition of direct rule, settler colonialism, cultural genocide, so-called civilizing missions, and of course, the point that's been made about an imposition, I would say, in the African context of European uh, patriarchy and gender norms that denied um, the centrality of women mm -hmm. to our societies, um, the dispossession of our sacred and hallowed property um, that was part of our culture, um, the politicization of indigeneity, who is indigenous, who belongs here, mm -hmm. who has an entitlement mm -hmm. to be on which land, and the restructuring of our governance systems, imposition of taxation without representation, and of course, the huge uh, damage that has been done in terms of ecocide, as has already been pointed out, that's in colonialism. And when we refer to neo-colonialism, we're now talking about the so-called modern phase. And uh, this notion of, uh, in an African context, independence is really a farce, because what we have in Africa is we still have a denial of African sovereignty. Those borders which were put there by European ruling elites, uh, so this notion of an Anglophone Africa, a Francophone Africa, a Lusophone Africa that separated indigenous uh, African nationalities and ethnicities from each other mm. that, were, that were part of uh, breaking down the power of the peoples uh, to be able to resist um, conquest and domination. And we've never recovered from that, which is why in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, in South Africa, at Zania, uh, we're told we have to buy back lands that were actually stolen from us. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this is really yeah. some of what we're talking about mm. yeah. when we refer to the Angamisi. Okay. Angamisi. That, 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 that's that, that's uh, uh, very, very clear. And, and let me, I see you nodding, uh, Ciao Tuleo, mm. and also uh, Carolina. So please respond. Uh, well, first, this, hallelujah. To, to this, thank you for this, this lecture. <laughs> yes. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much. Yes. It was so clear. Yeah. And I saw the similarities also in terms of uh, indigenous uh, like struggles and how it relates to one another. And you can't see the history uh, complete without, uh, with separating those two stories yeah. because yeah. it is, at the end of the day, one story. And um, I, I feel so, um, I think um, it's good to have this 
uh, unity more often, mm -hmm. seeing this unity more often, because most of the time, also in news, you see this and you see this indigenous and the Black Lives Matter, for example. And I think when we think about colonialism or neocolonialism, we should definitely find out how we can uh, uh, combine the forces, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's the same shit that happens <laughs> yeah. and it still continues. Okay. Ka Carolina? That's true what mm -hmm. Esther says very much. Thank you, Esther, for this. I have been following you via YouTube, all your talks, so mm. I know very much uh, <laughs> with the, the things that you are busy with. with um, um, yeah, well, about Black, Ma uh, Black mm. Lives Matter, uh, I do not know why, but I feel part of that um, struggle. Mm. I'm not black, but okay, my life is important. I always say to me, to myself. So in that way, I think that there is uh, unity with different genealogies of mm -hmm. struggles. Huh? Mm -hmm. We are talking about um, something that affects uh, African people and indigenous people. And like Esther says, who are these African people and who are these indigenous people who describe us, who had the power mm -hmm. to name us. Uh, and uh, I think the struggle is of recovering the, the voices uh, of mm -hmm. defining ourselves in, in a time that, uh, that is very much needed, especially with the environmental crisis, because then you have all these knowledges that are coming from different um, perspectives and, um, mm -hmm. and ways of seeing this crisis in, in which we are living it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and Rolando, uh, would you like to respond to um, the, the short lecture that we just had from, uh, from Esther? Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you very much, Esther. I, I would like to add a couple of things very briefly. One is, I think, I mean, we know it, but it's good to say it. Uh, the history that Esther brings us of indigenous First Nations, and uh, African people is the history of the majority of the world. Mm -hmm. right? Because I think when we talk of indigenous mm -hmm. or African, many people understand now they are speaking about minorities. No, mm -hmm. you are speaking about the majorities of the world. right? So mm -hmm. that is one thing. And, and this brings me to 1492 as a monument for the minority of the world to celebrate mm. their power. So I think it's one of the monuments that is coming down today. Uh, I mean, it came down already very strongly in when it was 500 years in 1992, where many First Nations got together across Abyayala and uh, to denounce this. And But the other very important thing that I hear in the in our conversation is mentioning the continuity mm -hmm. of colonialism mm -hmm. or what we might call coloniality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this continuity is, speaks to me of something very important that is the task of memory. If, we, if justice is going to come, like uh, Professor Ramos once told us, is because we are not forgetting. And our healing comes through remembering. The moment we forget, we we lose ourselves, right? So the communal that has been destroyed, uh, the possibility of other worlds that were withered and communal is still there latent because we haven't forgotten, right? It is not all completely gone. Even though the uh, West control education system, language, and it has been leading a war against memory against who we are. But this possibility of remembering, like in the Mapuche communities, mm -hmm. like in, in so many First Nation communities and African communities, is where the, where the hope lies. Mm -hmm. This hope for justice and this mm -hmm. hope for healing. And, and for us, the horizon, as our dear friend that recently died, Maria Lucones, always told us, the horizon is not just the resistance against the system. The horizon is the re-existence, the possibility of living again in communal worlds, of moving from the world of property 
to the world of gratitude, of moving from the logic of individuality to communality. So we do have alternative horizons that are in the memories. They are not invented as utopias of the future by mm. thinkers. They are ancestral mm. memories that are illuminating the path. So I think there is hope in that respect because we haven't forgotten and because we can have this conversation today. Mm. Okay, and, and Rolando, do, do you, um, are there any examples where decolonial thought is put into practice where we can see some alternative uh, horizons um, outside of uh, you know, the, the neoliberal worldview? Because you mentioned earlier, uh, you talked about the Zapatistas. Could you tell us a little bit more uh, about their worldview? And is that an, a good example for us to hold on to moving forward? Yes, well, the colonial thought is just a terminology mm -hmm. that some people find useful, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not what is inventing the resistance or what mm. is doing the work. It is a way of leading mm -hmm. what we might call the struggle in the academia, in the centers of Western knowledge. But actually the real struggle and the possibility of alternative worlds is being done by the communities. So the maroon communities across the Americas, the indigenous communities across the Americas, uh, that, of course also in other places of the world, and um, Africa, but also Southeast Asia, also Australia, also the North Pole, you know. And, uh, and the ex concrete examples that you can you can think of, of course, uh, the project of Zapatismo is incredibly important. It is a territory where more than a million people live in freedom, where they don't receive anything from the state, where they have reproduced their own systems of health, for healing, for education, for justice, where they have food autonomy. So it is a, a great example that other worlds are actually possible, even though they are not so visible for the mainstream or people that just watch the main media, but they are alive and they are big, mm. very big society. But also the maroon communities, also the counter plantation system in Haiti. So there are many examples around the world where people don't live in relation to hyper-consumption to capital and to individuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Esther, um, as a pan-African reparations scholar, you advocate uh, reparations as a way forward to move to a just world. Can you explain the broader context of reparations and, and what it means to you? Sure. Um, so it's important to say, as it's not actually what I'm saying. Somebody called Professor Rebecca Sosi, um, who's a professor of law in terms of indigenous people's law. She tells us that there's no uniform theory of reparations that fits all cultures, all nations and all peoples. But that being said, um, there is the notion of reparations in international law. And we know that international law as a field is contested uh, so, but there is something called the basic principles and guidelines on a right to a remedy and reparation for victims of gross violations of international human rights law and serious violations of international humanitarian law. And this is just a modern day uh, formulation that was codified in 2005 of uh, principles that are ancient, that go back millennia in terms of the struggles of uh, peoples, the majority peoples of the earth, to humanize the world in terms of our relations with each other. But in the UN framework, it recognizes that uh, reparations is holistic. It's multifaceted, multi-layered, and there are kind of five key principles. The first being that in order to repair the damage, because reparations, comes from the root is a repare, meaning to repair, okay? But in order to repair the damage, you have to stop the harm. 
So we have to have a cessation of violations, okay? Whatever's going on. So colonialism today, coloniality today, um, uh, racism, anti-African prejudice and discrimination, Afrophobia, uh, whatever it is, we have to stop that before we can talk about or envisioning repair in a true sense. Then there's a notion of restitution, which is something that African people and people who are defined or might self-define as indigenous is something that they've really kind of been championing a lot. And restitution is really about putting a people or a group that have experienced massive violations of their collective and individual rights uh, in the position they would have been in but for enslavement, genocide, colonization, etc. And a lot of the way that restitution works is say restitution of land, um, culture, heritage, property. Um, then there's a notion of uh, rehabilitation, which is about, you know, obviously, to rehabilitate, and that's about communities building themselves, family strengthening, mm. um, also looking at all the kind of social welfare dimensions, psychosocial sort of uh, remedies and programs that are necessary for people who have experienced enduring or intergenerational trauma and oppression. Uh, then there's the notion of compensation, which is what a lot of people reduce reparations to. Uh, but compensation is not really about money or just about money. But compensation is a remedy that is about putting an economic value on harm. And that could be restoration of lands. It could be trade justice. You know, there's different ways in which we compute uh, economic value, even in terms of our own cultures and heritages. Then there's this notion of satisfaction, all the measures that we put in place to feel satisfied that there's been some degree of redress, because to be very clear, for a lot of us, uh, we're never going to get total restitution. Um, and uh, that might include uh, symbolic measures. So uh, pulling down statutes of colonizers and genocidaires <laughs> and changing the curriculum and street names and teaching a new history, a new narrative of the contribution of people who have mm. been kind of relegated to being less than, uh, but teaching the true, uh, true role that such peoples have played. And the last one, which is should actually for me is the most important, but it's the least emphasized in public discourse on reparations, and that is guarantees of non-repetition. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that we create the circumstances in the world that what has happened to us never happens again? And not just to us, but to any other people. So for us in the African uh, International Social Movement for African Reparations, we use the, the what's referred to as the Chimwezu definition of reparations, taking the point that every group defines for themselves their own experience on what reparations mean, but holistic repairs, and that includes self-made repairs, mental, psychological, cultural, organizational, institutional, social repairs, economic repairs, political, educational, family repairs, relationship repairs, repairs in ourselves and group understanding of who we are, and repairs to our sense of dignity, value, worth, repairs to our reputation. And essentially, as Professor Karenga says, reparations is a process of the repairing and renewing and remaking of a people who are in the process and the practice of repairing, renewing, and remaking the world. It's about remaking the world, Ooh. ultimately. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this. Um, Carolina, uh, could you respond to this and also maybe tie this into, you know, how are we going to give justice to nature and reparations to, to, to the environment? I'm thinking, Esther, can you repeat the, the word that you used to, um, 
to give an example of genocide, you use something like uh, ma mamba was manga misi. Manga misi. Yeah, yeah, the manga misi. You know, I'm thinking about uh, about Jack Forbes. Uh, he was the, um, the leader of the anti-civilization movement in the States, mm -hmm. an indigenous academic. Um, and he talked about this, um, so about something similar. Have you ever heard about the wetico? No, no. The wetico illness? Mm. No. No? no. <laughs> yeah. the wetico. We, we see <laughs> the it Jack on the Forbes, screen. Yeah, yeah, the wetico. Well, um, it, is, um, it, is a, it is an illness that... Um, that encomp uh, encompass cannibalism, mm. yeah? Mm. But it's another sort of cannibalism, you know? The cannibalism was part of many European tribes too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just to show honor on uh, the opponent in uh, warfare. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jack Forbes uh, um, refers to, uh, to the Wetico to exemplify something else, and it consists uh, on devouring the life of other people to obtain personal benefits and profits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this is something that has been going on here in, in all these years. There is an illness around, uh, and that's the illness of the Wetico, the, um, the, the need to obtain uh, personal benefits and profits from people and mm -hmm. from, the, mm -hmm. uh, from our um, environment, from the planet, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. is destroying us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's something that needs to be to be discussed a bit more. I think that uh, everybody has uh, has felt the, the the illness of the wetico, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and the wetico apparently is also uh, a notion in in Africa, from what I hear from from Hester. Uh, and 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 the wetico today is is feeding with the life of millions of people. Uh, like uh, Rolando says, with millions, uh, with the mm -hmm. majority of us, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, genocides still uh, going on in indigenous territories and, uh, and things like that. So we need to acknowledge that there are weticos. And what is the word, Esther, again? Um, the African word. Yeah. Sorry, it's difficult. Ma Maanga Misi. Ma the Maanga Misi yeah. and the Wetiko is around. Yeah. So you see, we have okay. the version also in Avia Yala. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jack Forbes, I recommend mm -hmm. that book if you mm -hmm. can show it. Mm -hmm. it's, it speaks very well about uh, and, the, and make a the very good. Uh, um, yeah. Yes, it's, it comes from the indigenous tribes of, the, um, of Canada and the United States uh, to with the notion of cannibalism, but that type of cannibalism that is destroying us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they already knew at that time, okay, this is something mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. yeah. than rituals. This is something, um, it is another type of person uh, mm -hmm. that we have. There is another book of um, the... Um, uh, Waman Poma. Waman Poma, do you know something about Waman Poma? Was the um, chronist of the um, Inca Empire. Was um, mm -hmm. He was a mestizo. And he has, um, he wrote a letter that has been published in, in a book of four, four volumes. Yeah, it's a letter to the king. Mm. And in the first page, there is, um, there is the, the Inca, the Huayna Capa, uh, we're talking with an Spanish. Uh, an a Spanish person, and he said to the soul, you eat um, gold, is that what you eat? And the Spanish people, the Spanish mm -hmm. uh, said, yes, we eat gold. Mm. So um, many times it has been um, um, said that, um, that the humanization of Indian people, of indigenous people uh, went on, but also the indigenous worlds uh, dishumanized, uh, dishumanized the mm -hmm this new comer, mm -hmm. because for them it was inconceivable that somebody wanted to eat a gold mm -hmm. from January to, to, yeah. the, to, to, to all the months of the year. Mm. Uh, and gold was something special for indigenous uh, worlds. It was used to, to, for offerings, for mm -hmm. celebrations, for religion, mm -hmm. but not for every month to eat that e during the whole year. Yeah. So... I think that we need to acknowledge that we have this disease mm. and it's the first pandemic and the pandemic is still happening, yeah. I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Whoa, well, thank you for sharing. Um, time flies, and um, so we're running out of time. We're mm -hmm. uh, at the end of this, almost at the end of this session. And I would like to thank uh, all the all the guests, uh, Rolando Vasquez, Esther uh, Stanford Sosay, and also uh, Carolina Sanchez. Thank you very much for um, your wisdom, your words. I think mm -hmm. we we learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I also would like to thank uh, our online. Uh, audience and um, I would like to say for our online audience who are watching right after this program we will show a video portrait um, uh, this is an indigenous liberation series special mm -hmm. this is the first video of three and um, it follows Cesar Takuba uh, Cordillera and Igoro Elder who is active for the indigenous rights and culture in the Philippines. He is a political a refugee and activist based here in the Netherlands. So don't miss it. Um, you can also support uh, 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 our programming by donating and pay as you like uh, uh, via the website of Pakhuis de Zwijger. And to close off, um, uh, ciao to Leo. Mm -hmm. um, I would like uh, uh, you to tell us um, what is on the Indigenous Liberation Series programming next Monday. Next yeah. Monday. Yeah. Well, we have a lot to discuss. And for us, it's more about uh, the five teams. Uh, mm -hmm. We had this brainstorm sessions before together with Indigenous Diaspora. Uh, so uh, I think for us now, I don't know uh, exactly um, mm -hmm. uh, for next week. The okay. right to nature, the right... Ah, so you have to, yeah, we have okay. this uh, I, I have self determination. It here. I, I, I have it here, I thought. <laughs> you wanted to we share have the it right with us? To, yeah. uh, nature, the right to culture, yeah. the right to self determination, and uh, the, this is like the right to campaign from uh, Indigenous Liberation. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just to close off, it's going to be a very interesting uh, yeah. program next week. So uh, please uh, tune on and tune in. And once again, all of you, thank you very much. Thanks to you. Yes.